Welcome to the second part of today's introductory session in Cognitive Neuroscience. In order to understand and appreciate the role of Cognitive Neuroscience nowadays, it does make sense to also look at the history first. The first recorded reference to the brain comes from the Adam Smith papyrus. So papyrus discovered by the explorer Adam Smith. The author was presumably the Egyptian battlefield surgeon Imhotep. And it reveals a very interesting early knowledge about the lateralization of the brain. So what um, Imhotep um, had to do was treat soldiers that survived battle but had severe injuries to their head. And he noticed a lateralization of the injury. So for example, if a soldier were, um, had an injury at the left part of their brain, their right part of the body would be affected. And of course, we still know nowadays that, for example, the left part of the visual field is computed by the right hemisphere in the brain. In the ancient Greek philosophers or scholars did have some ideas about intelligence and brain, but they had quite a misconception. They thought of the heart as the seat of the mind or intelligence and the brain as a cooling mechanism. This was mainly due to the fact that Hippocratic doctors um, did think of the human body as something sacred that should not be injured. So their ideas of um, the human body was generally uninformed of anatom um, anatomical studies. However, some Greek scholars also did locate the mind or intelligence in the brain. In the 16th century, Vesalius was the father of modern anatomy and made these um, relatively detailed drawings. Well, they were differently detailed. So interestingly, the ventricles were very details, detailed, whereas the cortex was not so detailed. So um, this was because um, the ventricles were thought of being more important um, for, um, for cognition, for, for, for the mind or intelligence rather than the cortex. And this is also because there was just not so much um, people knew about the microstructure of the brain due to the lack of uh, appropriate microscopes and the like. Then later in the 19th century, Gall and Spurzheim were the first ones to accurately depict a brain. So you can see that the cortex is more accurately like the, the, um, the cortex as well as the, the cerebellum are um, depicted in, in much more detail than before. And along with that came the phrenology. So that was the first systematic approach to connect cognitive functions to the brain. So distortions in the skull and thus the brain were related to individual differences in cognition and personality. And this was sometimes oddly specific. For example, there was a brain area for thinking, for goodwill and compassion, for the sense of beauty of nature or, or language. So um, this was importantly not scientifically examined. This was really just speculation. Here's some more examples where you can see how um, personality traits were related to the brain or to the skull um, shape. So even though it was unscientific, it, give, it did um, give rise to the notion of a functional specialization of the brain, which was then also later more scientifically examined, um, for example, by Broca and Wernicke, who identified um, brain areas that are relevant to distinct language functions. So, for example, what um, they found was that um, there was uh, different areas for language comprehension and production. So this was some kind of empirical observation so we're talking about building blocks of cognition. Is language a sig single faculty or is there a dif distinct brain area for understanding and for producing speech? So um, these models of cognition about language production and understanding, for example, do not necessarily need a direct reference to the brain. So it doesn't really matter where in the brain it happens. It's just important for, it was just important for them to notice that 
one can be affected without the other one because that suggests that there is different areas for these two um, building blocks of language, for example. And this did also give rise to cognitive neuropsychology. For example, um, to lesion studies where the lesion of certain brain areas due to a stroke, for example, were then related to the deficit in very specific cognitive functions. But we'll talk about uh, lesion studies in uh, one of the next sessions. Then we come to the late 19th century, um, in which there was less of an interest in the neural underpinnings of the mind and more of an interest in consciousness and attention in personality. And of course, very prominent was uh, Sigmund Freud, who founded depth psychology. He stated that mind is partially conscious and partially unconscious, as illustrated with this iceberg here. So the conscious is only a small part of the entire cognitive processes or of the mind. However, the unconscious states or mental states can explain behavior and experience and accessing them will understand will help us to understand the human mind, but also to solve problems. The problem with depth psychology is that the theory is derived with unscientific methods. So it doesn't have any explanatory value because oftentimes they were just some kind of post hoc explanation for findings and um, a lot of assumptions were not falsifiable. Then in the late 19th century, there was also a different movement independent of that psychology, um, namely the first laboratory for psychological research at the University of Leipzig in Germany, where Wilhelm Wundt, the father of experimental psychology, did his experiments. So for example, he did the first response time experiments. Participants saw something on the screen and then they had to respond as quickly as possible as, um, as soon as they saw the dot. So um, sounds very trivial nowadays, but at the time it was a kind of a small revolution because it really brought forward the notion of the mind as something that can be measured. Another early psych experimental psychologist was Gustav Theodor Fechner, the founder of psychophysics. So psychophysics described the relationship between the psychological experience of senses and the material or physical world. So one example would be the just noticeable difference. So how much more does a weight have to weigh so that you would actually notice the difference between two different weights? Another example would be, imagine that you have a glass of water and you add a few um, grains of salt and then you add more and more until your participant would actually notice that there is salt in it. And then you could have a measure of um, the just noticeable um, amount. And then you could also ask questions like, for example, if I add, um, if I double the amount of salt, does it taste double as salty? Or maybe does it salt three times as salty, four times as salty? So these are psychometric functions and um, psychophysical researchers were the first ones to, um, to look at those and to appreciate the difference between the physical world and the perception of the physical world by the human mind. Another psychophysicist uh, was Helmholtz, Hermann von Helmholtz, a German physician and physicist. He also um, was famous for this uh, notion saying that physical reality and psychological reality are different. And um, he was particularly interested in optical illusions, who he thought could be the result of unconscious interference. So if you look at these, um, this is a, a much later illusion, but easier to illustrate on a slide. So have a look at the Ramakandran illusion. So here you can see nine um, nine dots or nine circles, you can see nine circles. And what most of you probably perceive here is that this is concave and this is convex. Interestingly, however, they're exactly the same dots. They're just rotated by 180 degrees. 
Now, what Helmholtz would argue here is that the difference here is because we um, we, inter we infer in inf in uh, the inference here that people would make is that light is usually coming from above. So that would be consistent with the view that this is convex and this is concave. So again, this is a reference to the unconsciousness, but because participants may not be aware of thinking about light coming from above, you probably didn't uh, think about light coming from above when you decided whether this is concave or convex. Um, so it's unconscious, but it is measured with scientific methods. Then in the early 20th century, behaviorism was really the leading school in experimental psychology and in measuring behavior. So the basic claim by behaviorists was that introspection is not objective and thus unscientific, should be avoided at all costs. Mental states cannot be examined scientifically and should remain in this black box here. So we have a stimulus, we have a response, that's what we're interested in. What's happening in between cannot be measured. So psychology should only observe the, um, should only concern itself with the observable behavior. Two of the key methods in behaviorism were classical and operant conditioning. Then came the uh, cognitive revolution in the 1950s, in which the black box was opened. Um, now researchers were more interested in seeing what is going on in the black box. This was inspired by novel computer technology, the idea of artificial intelligence, and, but also just a general interest in understanding the mind, which was in the black bo box for such a long time. So from those interests, cognitive science has emerged as an interdisciplinary study of the mind and its uh, processes. Still, it was very important to researchers to apply the scientific method um, and to use experiments rather than pure speculation, for example, as uh, Freudian um, scholars would, would do. Um, to give you an example, how the black box was um, trying to be measured. There was this very influential paper, The Magical Number 7, Plus or Minus 2, by Miller, which was the first experimental test of short-term memory capacity. So um, basically what he found out is that um, if, if you give people numbers, tell them numbers and they have to keep them in mind, they can usually memorize around 7 plus minus 2 items or numbers. Um, and he did that by giving them lists of numbers and he uh, measured it by asking them um, for those numbers. But still with this test you could actually um, experimentally test what's in the black box, namely the working memory, um, which has a storage capacity of, according to these studies, seven items. Here's a timeline of more recent developments of um, neuroscientific methods, keystones in the development of cognitive neuroscience. So in 1952, um, the first model that describes action potential, potentials in neurons was um, described. Um, and I'm gonna, gonna talk about these action potentials in the last part of today's session. There, were also, uh, there was also a very important finding, namely the single cell recordings were used to map the visual cortex by Hubel and Wiesel. So these orientation columns, we will see more of that in the session on the visual system and attention. Then in the 1965, there was event-related potentials used to um, explore cognition. And um, this was also something that helped understanding the mind uh, a bit better, also in, ter in, in, ter in, in terms of um, the timing of cognitive processes, how fast things happen in the brain. We'll talk more about that in the second session, which will be on EEG.
Then in 1968, the first MEG magnetoencephalography lab was opened. In the 1970s, structural imaging methods such as CT and MRI were um, used to enable more precise image of the brain and also brain lesions. Then in the 1980s, inexpensive computers allowed the digitalization of neural data so you could analyze the data more easily. For example, the IBM um, 286 was, uh, was uh, released and also the uh, Apple 1 and 2. And then finally in, the 19, in 1990, um, there was a discovery that blood oxygen levels changed the MRI signal. So this gave rise to a very important cognitive uh, neuroscience method, namely functional magnetic resonance imaging or fMRI. So as I mentioned before, the computer metaphor was quite important in shaping theories in cognitive sciences, in cognitive neuroscience, in psychology. So this was inspired by computer technology mostly merging in the 1950s with these very, at that time, computationally um, advanced computers. Um, and just to give you an example of how this affected theories in psychology, let's have a look at Broadbent's uh, theory that cognition is a sequence of different processes. So you don't really need to understand this theory in detail. This is really just to illustrate that um, cognitive processes were conceived of as um, something that can be described in computer metaphors. So you have an input, many um, parallel inputs, and then there's some sensory store and the selective filter makes the serial processing, limits it to one processing stream, and then something else is happening, something else is happening, and so on. So um, this was really um, because people thought of the brain also more as a computer. So by knowing how computers can be described, they thought they could also describe how the mind works. And to some extent, that is certainly still um, the case. Here you can see a flow chart of a central processing unit just to compare, okay, there's also arrows and boxes and so on. So this was somehow inspired by such drawings. Then later in the 1980s, um, there were also computational models that were inspired by the architecture of actual neurons or neural ensembles, such as these here. So you can see this is a schematic view on how neurons are connected and how they communicate. And this is a computer, computational node model that is derived from that. Okay, so much about the history of cognitive neuroscience. Next, we will have a look at the um, relationship between psychology and cognitive neuroscience.